The Cannabis Conversation. A European perspective on the emerging legal cannabis industry. Welcome to the Cannabis Conversation with Anoush Desai, where we explore the new legal cannabis industry by speaking to the professionals that are helping to shape it. This show is sponsored by Lumino. Lumino are a boutique HR and recruitment agency specializing in building high performance teams for the European cannabis industry. They work in three main verticals, commercial, medical, and plant facing. If you need help with HR or recruitment, please get in touch with them at luminorecruit, one word, dot com. Got a great show about cannabis and big tech coming up now. Enjoy. On today's show, we have Chris Kelly and Owen Keenan. They are the co-founders of Good Rays, which is a CBD beverage brand. Guys, welcome. How are you doing? Hey, Anuj. Yeah, doing great. Thanks for having us. Thanks for having us. No, real pleasure. Where in the world are you today? In London town. Still in, in London, yeah. Yeah, I'm over in uh, Hackney. Ah, very nice. We're all hiding from the COVID, obviously. Cool. Well, this is a really interesting show because we're going to be talking about big tech, FAMGA, whatever the different words of describing those guys are, and how that interacts with cannabis or not, as the case may be. But before that, let's just start where we usually start with a bit about you guys. If you could both sort of introduce yourselves and tell us a bit about your background and how and why you got into the cannabis space. Chris, do you want to kick off? So yeah, my background is in media, really. So I come from, did sort of 15, 20 years in the media business, worked in TV, worked in film, worked in digital, and had the experience of being funded by big tech business in Google. So had a business called Copper 90, which was a digital media business based around football that was funded by Google. So I spent a lot of time around them, but I kind of jumped from you know, everything from Bebo back in the day to MySpace to Facebook to Google so and YouTube. So I've sort of seen a lot of the tech world as they've encroached in the media space. And I left my business in 2016, which I managed fortunately to sell part of to uh, Turner Broadcasting and left that business looking around, really kind of thinking about what I wanted to do next and fortunately came across the cannabis industry. And I spent most of 2018 working with Aurora, who are one of the big Canadian cannabis businesses, making content for them, educational content, got to go and visit their facilities out in Denmark and really had my eyes opened, I think, to what was happening in the industry. And at that stage, I kind of made my mind up that that was, that was the industry I wanted to be in because it felt like it was, you know, the right time and it was very interesting to me, to me personally, as well as, you know, just meeting great people. You know, I had a, a brilliant experience meeting all these amazing kind of innovators in the space through Aurora and then, you know, connected with Owen and another friend of mine, Justin, and another Owen and came up with the concept of a good raise. So, yeah, it's been a pretty busy few years, but super interesting and probably the steepest learning curve that I've ever had. Yeah, and everyone's on that learning curve because it's all new to everyone, really. And when you were kind of looking at this, was there any kind of, did you think about any stigma or is any family or friends that kind of gave you a funny look? Not really, not really. I think there were a couple of light bulb moments for me. And, and one of them was, you know, I spent through sort of working in the media, you know, you spend a lot of time in the, the hub of the media world, which is LA. And, you know, I sort of had a few moments over there when, you know, seeing what was happening with the medical cannabis sort of position, then also sort of seeing how mainstream it had become and how little stigma there was, you know, in a period of a few years. And I was at a friend's house who was a sort of CEO of a big trainer brand, and I remember after dinner one night, he offered me a, a mint, a cannabis mint. And I was like, all right, what? Well, that's totally normal. And no, you know, it was a completely normal thing to do. And I remember thinking, wow, this is actually happening. And it's happening in my lifetime, which I, I just didn't think it would. So I've had a few of those moments where I've just sort of realized that, you know, this isn't any different than any other, you know, 
substance that people take or use. And in fact, when you really start to look into it, it's much better for you than most of the other state sponsored drugs that exist. So, yeah, no real sort of stigma or or issues from anyone in my world, to be honest with you. And I found that really uh, quite surprising how accepting people are of, you know, the cannabis space quite more broadly. But certainly for us, you know, CBD is uh, there's a bunch of education required, but it's, you know, it's an effective and incredibly useful product so we're definitely breaking down some of those walls if they do still exist yeah no absolutely and i think it's a bit of an easier conversation coming from the media side i suppose and also if you're familiar with california i speak to a lot of people that come from corporate finance and it's a slightly different story about their journeys but thank you for sharing that oh and now over to you feel free to let us know a bit about your background yeah, sure. I mean, thanks firstly for having us on. I know Chris and I have both been big listeners, so it's great to get the opportunity to chat to you. But yeah, I think my, my background then is obviously slightly different. I mean, I've been working in cannabis and CBD for seven years now. You know, I started at university studying drug policy and cannabis policy and as part of a sociology degree. And, you know, quite soon after that, as becoming a big plant advocate and you know, being very interested in drug policy, I was really interested in what was happening in the States and Canada. So I went over there basically to, to understand the industry on the ground, you know, everything from farms to production to supply chain all the way up to the brand. So yeah, I think seven years is probably one of the longest serving professionals in the UK, which is a, a nice title to have, or at least one of them. So it's, it's been interesting. And I think, yeah, from my time over there originally, you know, the first times in, in the States and in Canada, I was fascinated by the culture, but also the fact that you could actually make a living and, a, and an industry out of this, which is a real yeah light bulb moment that Chris talks about is that this is, number one, it's legitimate, it's happening, and it's going to happen globally. And the things I realized quite quickly over there that there was three real areas of growth which were exciting to me. You know, and cultivation was never really one of them. Manufacturing never really one of them. I think the spaces back then, you know, in 2015, it was... What was really interesting was, number one, ancillary services. So building the ecosystem surrounding the cannabis industry, just like this. Two was innovation, what we can do with cannabinoids, how we can deliver them differently. And number three was brands, right, which is the most important thing, I think. And I think the next wave of interesting cannabis innovation was within the brand space, right, actually delivering these products to consumers and educating consumers. But when I came back to the UK, I mean, it probably wasn't the right time to start a, a brand. You know, no one really knew what CBD was. So I met up with some guys and helped start you know, Prohibition Partners, Europe's biggest CBD and cannabis advisory service, and events group Cannabis Europa, which is serendipitously where, where Chris and I actually met first. Um, and obviously, the, you know, the idea of those was to help advise the industry, bring together the industry, push forward legislation, but also, you know, encourage best practice within the industry. So I worked with, you know, activists, regulators, politicians, industry leaders from FMCG, but also from pharmaceuticals. And was really helping to shape the industry. And I think, yeah, a few years ago, I felt like was becoming the time to actually move into the consumer side, which the brand side, which is always my passion, you know, delivering number one, mainstreaming cannabis and CBD to consumers. You know, the great thing about a beverage and the great thing about, you know, kind of lifestyle brands is that you can present these, you know, on an airline within trains, you know, in gyms, in spas, in convenience stores in your local shops in a way that you necessarily can't do with medical products, which I found really exciting. And then I think also just the widespread level that you can get to with such an, like a kind of interesting portfolio of products, which goes outside of the niche, you know, using for information, but using it for relaxation, anti-anxiety and for stress. So yeah, I mean, Chris and I met actually originally at kind of stroke, as I mentioned, and kind of kicked it off from, from day dot. Great. I mean, it's a great little story and you really are a UK industry veteran. They say cannabis years are like dog years, right? So you nearly clocked up 50 there. Yeah, I feel no. <laughs> <laughs> I bet. I bet. But it's what's really interesting about your story is you're coming from drug policy, you know, which is, is a discipline in itself. And you kind of moved very much into the commercial field by discovering the kind of areas of opportunity. What's your relationship with drug policy now? Do you still keep an eye on how things are moving in that area? Yeah, absolutely. And, and I'm fascinated by it. And I think, you know, in those early years, looking at moving into the policy side, which is, you know, where I kind of wrote my original dissertations and was probably my original interest in the space. And I think coming into London and coming into the commercial world and understanding it was that actually changing policy through best practice, you know, commercialization and also creating a commercial market behind this 
is actually a massively influential tool in creating policy change. And I kind of never forget that, but always try and keep my ear to the ground and what's happening on the policy and politics side, you know, when the kind of uh, bread and butter of running an FMCG business, uh, you know, can I get space in between that? But yeah, yeah, I try and keep in touch with, you know, I was, I go to all the cannabis ropers. I stay in touch with all the people I used to work with, you know, make sure we know what's happening from a policy side. And I think from a brand perspective, being really close to the compliance and the regulation is massively important when it comes to something like CBD, right? Because you see what's happened on the side of novel foods and being as clean and as best practice as possible, but also working with retailers on best practice is kind of where you're going to bring the industry into a whole new phase of development. And that's what's been the most exciting thing. Well, for me personally, of doing this work with Goodraise is going to big grocers, big retailers, educating consumers all the way up to those retailers and putting in a policy for them to build a CBD category. That is, you know, massively rewarding. Yeah, absolutely. And I think you highlight a good point that, you know, whilst you might think a lot of drug policy is kind of social policy in a way, actually what drives a lot of it would be the you know, we live in a capitalist society, so it would be a commercial sector that maybe exposes the powers that be to thinking slightly differently. But this is a topic in its own, which we could discuss another day. Let's move on to Good Race. Tell us a bit about that. And you briefly touched on how it came to be, but tell us a bit more about that and what you do. Yeah, sure. So, you know, as I mentioned, Chris and I met at, at Cannabis Rope. And I think at that time, you know, 2018, 2019, what I was really interested in, Chris, like we just hit it off from basically the first conversation. We had the same perspective is it was really interesting things happening you know, on the policy side, on the cultivation, on the manufacturing side. But where we felt was maybe a new area of development, which goes back all the way to the time in California, was that there's nothing really happening on the brand side. There's nothing, there's no real lifestyle brands being developed and focusing on being a really amazing brand, connecting with the consumer, understanding the consumer and then educating them. So I think we hit it off based on on that basic ideology, right? And also the fact that, I mean, you've probably seen, you know, as well as any of us do about the CBD market and whether the products are as effective as they can be or whether the doses are as effective as they can be. And we felt there was a space there for a premium brand with really high dosage that delivers, you know, the genuine relaxation and anti-anxiety effects of CBD. You know, we put 30 milligrams in every single product and we felt there was a very massive space there to make sure everyone knows how many drops actually to take with an oil, how much milligrams you want in a beverage, how many milligrams you want in a gummy to actually feel the full benefits. And, you know, Chris and I are both cannabis and CBD users and know the full benefits. And that's something we wanted to spread to consumers. And yeah, Chris introduced me to the other guys, Justin and Owen. I don't know, Chris, do you want to tell them a little bit more about that? Yeah. So I suppose just to sort of add to that, I think that first conversation we had, we were in a room full of lawyers, finance people, doctors, you know, people that were, you know, very active and doing very important work in the cannabis space. But, you know, there didn't seem to be many brand people around. So I think that was, again, where we sort of saw the opportunity. And again, my background, I've spent, you know, many years working with the likes of Red Bull and Perno Ricard and the, all the big booze brands, which you tend to do when you work in the media. And we sort of both came to the conclusion that, you know, the best way to really kind of create a mainstream product where you could educate people and where you could kind of change perceptions around this plant was to create a beverage brand. So that sort of was even in that first conversation, I think that was that was where both of us kind of came to immediate agreement. But yeah, I mean, I think just to talk to the other guys a little bit is so Justin Stone is a good friend of mine. And I've been talking to him for many years about working together because he came from a background in e-com. So he built a hundred million pound turnover e-com business called Surfdome and really understands and understood how to scale businesses and how to you know run a fmcg business and you know everything from the supply chain to logistics he's an absolute expert at that so i brought him in quite quickly and said look i think this is the opportunity this is the thing that we should be doing and he kind of very quickly I think got to know owen and said yeah this is a good option let's do this the other guy that we brought in is a guy called Owen Tozer, who came from, he's a designer, photographer, filmmaker, just all around creative. He'd actually been the original kind of creative director at Tenzing Energy. So I'd introduced him to Hub, who's a, another friend of mine, and he'd gone and helped Hub to sort of develop that brand. And, you know, then eventually to the point where we were seeing it driving around London on buses. So 
he sort of was an integral part in that in building that business so we sort of felt like we'd covered all the bases with you know me on the sort of production content brand side Owen on the compliance and you know general sort of cannabis industry know-how and then Justin with the kind of experience in e-com and and scaling businesses in a sort of product space plus Owen's creative flair so you know we felt like we had all the ingredients right from the start and you know that very quickly it's a strange thing to say but in a way the sort of covid pandemic played to us because we'd all kind of managed to shut off a lot of the other distraction and really really focus on getting this business off the ground so it's a business that was born out of an adverse time but actually it played to our benefit i think i think the covid pandemic as well i don't want to say played into our hands because it sounds insensitive to you know covid and, and all the negatives of covid but it was a useful time for us, one, because it changed people's perspective about wellness, mental health, relaxation, stress, anxiety. And I think our fundamental belief at the beginning was that something like anti-anxiety, something like stress relief and wellness done correctly with the right doses doesn't just belong in somewhere like Holland and Barrett. It belongs in the mainstream, you know, it belongs, you know, with, with proper global distribution. And that's what we wanted to focus on is how can we go out there and get you know, hundreds of thousands of listings, how can we go out there and get this into everyone's hands? And, you know, from that fundamental belief of basically changing the definition of wellness and the future of wellness and bringing them outside of the niche into the mainstream, which I think taps into the consumer trends that we're in and running good rays like an FMCG business and bringing that message to lots of different consumers has been kind of fundamental driving force. And I think it's been a pretty crazy, you know, year, two years where, We've gained, you know, 500 plus listings, you know, going on Amazon. We're all in with the, all the delivery services, going on Selfridges and talking to major grosses for 2022, which I think is going to be a major year for the category as a whole. I think distribution is going to change massively next year. And I think that's what's really exciting. And yeah, I think since that initial, you know, initial launch, we've brought on some amazing other team members, you know, brought on a non-exec director in a guy called Shalen Patel who's the co-founder of Distilled Ventures and um, Diageo's investment arm and is also chairman of uh, Lucky Saint, uh, the non-alcoholic beer and a non-executive director of Pentire as well. Yeah, you know, strategic advisor for a number of other big FMCG uh, challenger brands. And we've also brought in a you know killer sales team. We've brought in Lee, who is a guy who led the you know commercial director position at Cafe Pod, a first market coffee business. Gav Bacon, who was formerly Matthew Clark, and Burfin as well, who was you know, head of sales at Square Root Soda, as well as Dalston Soda. So we've got a pretty killer team we're, we're pretty delighted with. And you know, we're basically focused every day on making sure, have we got the best products in the market? You know, Are we producing a scale as fast as we can and making sure we're always on time and getting the operations right? And making sure we're selling out there, conver- you know, conversing and educating all the retailers. And that's kind of what we've been, you know, nailed down on since basically, yeah, the very beginning. Yeah. Wow. Great story. There's loads there. But maybe you just talk about the products. How many SKUs have you got and what sort of products have you got in the market at the moment? So we've got um, four Celtics at the moment. And where we've positioned it is your genuine relaxation benefits. As is talk about 30 milligrams per product but also sophisticated flavor experiences. So we don't see it as, you know, a Coca-Cola plus CBD or a lemonade plus CBD. We want something to be a really good liquid with its own right and to taste like a good race, you know, to be totally unique. So we're really proud of those kind of flavor combinations. And, you know, if you're an FMCG business, the most important thing is flavor and taste. We also have tinctures as well, which is just rolled onto our e-commerce store and gummies as well. So it's quite exciting as well. I mean, I think we're the first brand out there with that kind of product portfolio and, yeah, I think they're all based around those two fundamental principles, you know, high quality flavor and genuine genuine benefits. Yeah, absolutely. And I mean, look, there are a few competitors in each of those product categories. What do you think your USP is? I think we focused on you know, making sure we're really strong on dosage. I mean, if you look at the drinks market, we offer double what most of the market offers. And the reason we do that is we want we want everyone to basically consume it like they would consume a coffee or a beer or any other functional drink. They get the full benefits within one unit. That's what we want to offer them. And, you know, let's be honest, CBD drinks are not the most the cheapest drink in the market. I think that's number one. Number two is, you know, that those kind of flavor experiences. You know, I think everyone who owns a brand will probably say their flavors are the best. I mean, we definitely think our, ours are high quality. We'll get you some samples to get you uh, get some feedback, independent feedback. 
And I think, yeah, we've got legitimate cannabis and CBD experience and knowledge. And we try and make sure that comes across in all our marketing and our content and our education. You know, we're really strong in terms of educating the consumer. You go to our FAQ page online, we've probably overdone it. I think we've got, you know, 50, 60 questions up there. But we think it's a big part of, of what we're trying to do is educate, you know, everyone across it from regulators to retailers to consumers. I think also to add to that, I'd say that one of the things that we are very passionate about and you know maybe it's not a usp but it's certainly a sort of pillar of our business is we're massive advocates and fans of the cannabis plant you know whether that's in terms of it's being able to use it in terms of our packaging or supply chain and also being able to sort of really talk about that and talk about cannabis whereas i think there are other cbd brands that sort of shy away from that perhaps they're nervous about the you know potentially the negative stigma that we touched on earlier but i think you know really it's our job as a cbd brand and a cannabis brand is to really educate people and break down those barriers because there's so much that this plant can do. If you talk to the the likes of, you know, Glenn Mitchell at Jersey Hemp and Jamie Bartley at Unite and Sam Cannon at Beyond the Green, you know, these guys are on a mission to really sort of make sure that hemp gets its rightful place at the table. And they've all been up at COP26, you know, banging that drum and really kind of, you know, actively going out and telling that story. So we want to be a part of that. You know, we want to be a part of the stories around how CBD helps people, how it's alleviating anxiety, how it's a better option than alcohol in many for most people so i think we're really like fans of the plant and we want to talk about it we don't want to shy away from that yeah great to hear we love that and i think the core of that is education as you say which is a core sort of component of this show so i'm I'm really happy to support that always and with that in mind maybe you can help educate us about big tech so Facebook, Amazon, and Google are probably the most relevant ones here, I assume. But, you know, generally, the big tech guys, they affect all of us in many different ways in our lives. If we take a step back in a kind of very kind of 101 approach, digital advertising generally work, and how does it apply to the CBD industry? Yeah, in terms of the status, I mean, we're pretty familiar with it, as I imagine most brands do. And, you know, when you talk to other brands in the space, we have this conversation quite regularly. And I've been doing it for quite a while as well because we did it at Prohibition Partners and Cannabis Europa. I mean, fundamentally, what, of course, you can promote is you can promote education, you can promote content for us as as Prohibition Partners and Cannabis Europa in an independent group, not flogging any products. No issue actually there. You know, you can get whitelisted fairly easily. When it comes to promoting products, you know, you're you're pretty much facing a ban, right? So, you know, Facebook and Instagram, you know, they will flag all CBD, cannabis and hemp content and ban that. And, you know, they can kind of create account closure for up to six months. And I mean, just to clarify, that's paid advertising, right? On those platforms. That is paid advertising. The problem with the paid versus organic is when you have one singular channel running both your organic content and your paid content, if you get flagged for your paid content, your organic content suffers as well, right? So oh. what a lot of brands do is, you know, they take the basic rules, right? You cannot promote any copy which says the word CBD, cannabis, or hemp. You cannot promote any content that uses those words or uses that imagery. And then they promote that. But then also now the algorithms start to pick up what else is on your organic content. If you have hashtags, if you have content, if you have copy around those terms, and it also gets flagged. So it's kind of a double-edged sword and essentially there's a blanket ban. I mean, you can fight it as many ways as you want and there are workarounds, don't get me wrong, there are absolute workarounds that you can do. You can build out dummy accounts, you can build out landing pages without these words and you can drive the traffic there or you can go for awareness. But fundamentally, you can't advertise your key USP, right, which is the CBD and the cannabis and, and the plant and the story that all of us want to tell. So yeah, it's it's a real challenge for brands in the space. And I think you know, the way we focus on it is, okay, let's go and bring education to those core communities. That's what we do in terms of our organic content and our website content and make sure we're really strong on that and also make sure we're really strong on distribution, right? Distribution and sales and getting this product in front of as many people as we can. That's the most important thing. And until Facebook and Instagram change, I, I don't think there's a huge opportunity within digital advertising I know there are a lot of brands doing it and there are a lot of agencies that will offer you services to you know perform these workarounds but I would be very interested to see the return on ad spend I you know I very much doubt it's as you know profitable as it should be 
That's a real good learning for me. I didn't realise they were so extensive in how much they were policing this. I thought, okay, fair enough. You're not allowed to use those keywords in your paid ads, but I didn't realise they'd go after what you do outside of that and kind of hunt you down for that bit as well, which is very nasty in my opinion. But we bring up a couple of things there, which are really interesting. Well, I mean, someone threw a number at me. I don't know if this is right, but something like 80% of digital marketing is Facebook and Google. So if they are kind of not open to this, that's obviously a massive barrier. I was going to ask you about retail. So, I mean, retail is the obvious like, bricks and mortar way to get your name out there. Is that necessarily a bigger part of this now because of the landscape you're dealing with? Yeah, I think so. I mean, we're fundamentally really interested in distribution, right? I mean, as, as any FMCG brand that is starting up, you know, the core principles there are, you know, product production and distribution, right? Where's your distribution? You know, the way I think about digital advertising and kind of, you know, big flashy marketing in general is it comes in once you have your distribution sorted. And for a lot of CBD brands, that still isn't the case, right? So they're overspending on marketing and underspending on distribution, which is, you know, a fundamental issue and not necessarily how, yeah, startup FMCG brands are, are run. So we definitely think about bricks and mortar, you know, not our own individual bricks and mortar right now, but, you know, partnering with, you know, premium retail and really good retailers that are good on education, strong on education. I mean, definitely everyone is interested in Amazon, right? I mean, that's the, that's the other one that we should definitely talk about. You know, from a UK perspective, it's probably less well known in terms of how, how they've backed the CBD industry, but they have. They've opened up this year quite, quite significantly on an invite only program for some of the specialist high quality and really compliant brands will actually go live in, in the next few weeks, which is quite exciting. And I think they're basically running a pilot program to see just how it works so far. You know, the verification process is good and strict. So it kind of makes sure that you have all good quality brands and you're not bringing in anything that's, you know, maybe gray market or, or non-compliant. And yeah, interestingly in the US, they've come out as well, you know, to basically lobby for cannabis legalization. And, you know, I suppose if you look, if you look at the fine print, it's partly a logistical solution, right? It's because they can't hire people fast enough with, you know, the extensive use of cannabis in the US, which is obviously interesting. So they're making it easier for hiring, but it's also, you know, it's, it's basically, you know, partly for equality is right. Creating an equitable workplace ideology. So banning drug screening for cannabis, you know, firstly, as I said, because it's a logistical nightmare, but secondly, because their data shows it creates a barrier of employment to marginalized community and drug screening, as we know, disproportionately affects people of color. So they're lobbying for the MORE Act, you know, they're lobbying for the Cannabis Administration and Opportunity Act. They're trying to get cannabis removed from the Controlled Substances Act. So they are moving on it and it's quite exciting to see. And, you know, they're going as far as saying to expunge federal nonviolent marijuana crimes and allow for resentencing of any individual currently in federal prison for for cannabis crime. So, yeah, we take a lot of excitement in that. It is great. I mean, of course, it very much benefits them to be able to sell cannabis on Amazon because there's probably no better product, right? High value and and low bulk, which is definitely, well, a vested interest. <laughs> yeah, and really, really useful background there on the on some of the Amazon stuff. It's obviously been warmly welcomed within the industry that they're positive on it. But as you highlight, there are some self-interested reasons for doing that. Chris, maybe you want to talk about, you've got some really good kind of experience with these sort of big companies. What are some of the other issues? We obviously talked about advertising there quite a lot, but maybe around the social media side and the apps. Well, I think interestingly, I mean, it's, you know, by having spent a lot of time in and around those businesses, I mean, cannabis is not a dirty word within those businesses at all. You know, a lot of them are California based. It's a very much a part of life there. So it's interesting that they haven't been more vocal or, or more accepting of cannabis, whether that be advertising or brands or apps or that type of thing. But I think ultimately, you know, with big tech businesses, they're interested in the bottom line and, you know, they've got other fights that they'd probably rather fight with the US government. You know, I'm not saying I'm an expert on US policy by any means, but I mean, I think all the strategies of those companies, but I, I think what's great to see is that Amazon are taking a lead in that. So I think that they will lighten up some of those restrictions for sure. I know that I was chatting to a guy from Snap the other day and they said they're actually looking now to start to allow advertising for cannabis and CBD products on the platform. So, you know, I think it's small steps for all of them, but ultimately what's kind of frustrating as a brand when, you know, we all know that there's a Google and Facebook tax if you want to 
market to a big consumer base. So, you know, you've got to go and pay the piper, but it would be great to see them sort of become, I suppose, more better regulated in terms of, you know, the good actors, the people that are following all the rules, the people that are, you know, selling products in legal markets. I think we should see them open up those policies soon. And, you know, I think as evidenced by most things that happen in the tech world, you know, it only takes one to do it. And then generally there's a sort of follow on. So I, I'm confident that it will happen. And I think that, you know, we will get that opportunity to advertise. But as it stands at the moment, the best way for us to spend money is to sort of build SEO, because SEO ultimately is still, you know, a super powerful tool in terms of, you know, making sure that you're visible to people that are looking for your product. And, you know, Google, well, both Google and Amazon are huge, huge drivers of in interest and because they're effectively just search engines so i think we'll see it change i don't think until it's very clear that it's going to be federally legal in the us i don't think they're going to act very fast but you know they will they will eventually i think yes fingers are crossed so you're talking about other avenues the one that frequently comes up you know in relation to this issue is, is the kind of rise of using influencers how are you guys seeing that also does that also create issues because the influencers platforms are these companies that we're talking about? So how does that kind of coexist, if you like? Yeah, I mean, it's an interesting one for us. I think Owen sort of alluded to it earlier, but we sort of, you know, and I think it's easy to fall into this trap, but you, you sort of initially when you launch a beverage business, you consider yourself in alignment with all the beverage companies that you know. So you think about yourself in terms of Red Bull and Monster and Carling and Heineken. But actually what you realize very quickly is that you're not like them because you don't have distribution and everything that we do in terms of marketing and everything, every dollar that we spend on marketing is ineffective unless someone can then take that piece of marketing, get it kind of into their brain and then walk into a store and buy the product. So we've definitely scaled back our ambitions in that space for year one and year two, because we kind of feel like the best marketing that we can do at the moment is to be on a shelf. You know, it's to be in a store where people can pick up the product, they can look at it, they can touch it, they can get a bit of information, you know, within a behavior that they're actually just doing anyway. So I think, you know, very much the influencer strategy, which I think is useful and it will definitely come into play for us at the moment, is it kind of on the back burner. We've got some great investors who are influential in their own right. So we'll be leaning on those guys at the right moments in time. But I think, you know, going out and developing a sort of a definitive influencer strategy at the moment is not on our priority list. Just to add to that, right, with an influencer strategy, you want that to be really well correlated with your paid strategy as well, right? You want to use the content that you generate from your influencer partnerships back into your paid media. And without having that option, it becomes difficult to do it really effectively. And I think as Chris said, you know, the most exciting thing for us is just getting the product out there in as many shows as we can. And that's the one really big advantage of having gummies and beverages and tinctures, right? You know, there's basically not a shelf that you can go and buy things on that we won't be able to be on. That's that's what we find really exciting. It's just the amount of distribution points you can have as an FMCG business, particularly in the beverage market. I mean, there's, you know, if you go to buy anything these days, there's going to be somewhere somewhere you can buy a drink very close by. Yeah. Absolutely. Okay. So look, very exciting and a kind of great way and positive way to sort of finish the show up. I guess we need the big guys to, to act soon, I hope. But in the meantime, it's great that you guys are getting out there into sort of bricks and mortar stores. And I look forward to trying some samples. Hint, hint. <laughs> we'll send you the new products. As soon as the new ones arrive, you'll be top of the list, Anish. Thank you. I appreciate it, mate. That's really good. <laughs> guys, thank you so much for joining me. It's been a really interesting discussion. And it'd be great to have you back on at some point in the future. Yeah, of course. Anytime. No, great. Thanks for having us. As soon as the federal le legislation goes through, we'll be back on talking about <laughs> how effective Instagram marketing is. Oh, I don't want to wait that long. <laughs> <laughs> and keep up the good work, Anusha. I'm really like the amount of information and brilliant insight that I've got from your podcast. Yeah, it's been hugely valuable to me. So yeah, keep it up. It's a very good thing you're doing. Thank you. I appreciate that. Thanks, guys. Thanks for listening. Hope you enjoyed the show. If you did, please subscribe, rate, review and share the podcast. It will help me spread the good word on how this amazing industry is developing. I work with various cannabis startups to help them get funded and grow. I also work with corporates and international cannabis companies to help them understand and navigate the European cannabis sector. We're working with some great clients across the cannabis value chain and we'd love to help you too. 
please visit www.canvas.global to get in touch.